I think most people already know who I am, but if you don't, I'm Dr. Tyler Hendricks. I'm a board certified family medicine physician. And uh, no, I'm not that famous. Not people don't already know who I am, but so nice to meet you all. <laughs> Today I'm talking with someone who inspires me a lot, who uh, I've known for a few years now, my boss, Frigid Health, Vikas. Yeah, thank you for having me, Tyler. <laughs> it's a pleasure. And so we actually were already talking a little bit before the podcast um, because there's a lot of stuff we probably don't know about each other, even though we've mm. worked together for the last few years. But uh, in recent last few weeks, we have been talking a little bit about your upbringing. I find it super interesting. Um, you know, everybody, especially as I'm getting older, I'm realizing that my upbringing was quite unique being a young gay male in North Florida, South Georgia, and just how that you know affected me. And pushes me still to this day to be the person that I am. And so I think it's really important to talk about, you know, where you come from, your experience growing up, because obviously, even though we don't always think about it, and it's not always on the top of our head, um, it does impact who we are and the decisions that we make now. So um, if you want to just give us some background on on your early years. <laughs> yeah, I grew up uh, right outside of Detroit in Sterling Heights um, in a very... Um, white community. In fact, my sister and I were the only two Indian um, kids in our school. Um, and, you know, we joke about it in the office, but there was, there was probably many years beyond when you think one should recognize self-identity that I did not truly recognize that I was not white. Right. Right. And it, it's the weirdest thing to say now. It was like, how are you, are you, you can't be that dumb. <laughs> but the reality was, it's just, I just was surrounded by people right. of a very similar background type, whatever you want to call it. And I didn't see myself as any different. Right. Right. It's not till we changed schools and we went, you know, one school district over It's the most diverse school district in Oakland County. And like, Oh, Oh, okay. People are different. And I, I think that has guided me a little bit more so because what I didn't like when I went to the new school is seeing how clicky different cultures were. I see. Right? right, because before there was no cultures, I didn't see clicks or get clicks, and then finally seeing that, I never understood why if the whole goal is to kind of meet other kind of people, learn new experiences, here you are with the ideal place to go do that, right. and yet the reverse happened. Everyone just kind of became into their own groups, and I saw the same thing with even my parents. For them, I get it. Right. Immigrants need a support structure. Language is a barrier. Culture is a barrier. So you find familiarity. Right. And you see that across America in most um, towns where there's a lot of immigrants. There's pockets where people of like backgrounds kind of stick together for support. But I didn't understand why that continued to happen, even with first gen, second gen kids. Right. When it's no longer needed. You don't need to stick to your own. And I actually think it's prevented a lot of my friends and other people I've seen from having that growth curve or that, that, that arc into understanding things more broadly. Yeah. Um, and I think it's why I like moving every few years. I like living overseas. I find other cultures. I seek out learning about other people and other things right. for that very reason that I never understood from the beginning why people isolate themselves and I never wanted to be that person. Right. Um, and I think in a weird way, it's kind of come through even at Rougette Health. If you look at our employee makeup, I know. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't intentional. We didn't have, you know, any desires to go, we're going to be this many percent male to female or this many percent um, sexual orientation. It just happened naturally. And I think we have one of the most diverse places. And I love the energy it brings to our office, unique to what I've seen at any other place I've worked. Yeah, I totally see that. I'm usually the only gay one. So <laughs> it's nice. And now I, you're like, I know. Well, I'm like, well, now, you know, I'm just the other white guy. <laughs> But it kind of relating to what, you know, you experienced growing up, I went to a, um, a private Christian school and went at a really conservative upbringing. And so the majority of the kids at, at my school were all white as well. And, you know, I really think uh, my queerness is what kind of drew me out of that. You know, I, I go back and think of all the friends that I've made in high school and even, you know, we weren't. Uh, really clicky, but really as a class of a hundred, we were a giant click. It was all white kids. Mm -hmm. We all had upper middle class, you know, upbringings, uh, certain education. And it was really just this bubble that I, I didn't even realize I was a part of. But the more I became into my queerness, the more I realized I don't really fit in this bubble. And the more different I was, the more uh, I realized I was kind of being pushed to the side. I look back now, of course, that was really traumatic at the time. But now I thank 
you know, my queerness for like allowing me to see different opinions, different perspectives. Um, because I, I always think back if I was still, you know, in that bubble, it's really hard to leave. It's comfortable. It's, it's, you know, where your friends are mm -hmm. It's everyone that you, you know, is similar and, and similarity is diffi a difficult cycle to break. But I, I think you hit the nail on the head that to have personal growth, you really have to extend beyond that comfort zone. And so for me, my queerness brought me out of that. But I think for you, it was just sort of your own ideas and, and direction and realizing at an early age that I need to see more. I need to, you know, experience more to be my optimal self. Yeah. And the other weird thing that I think came out of that is it wasn't just a all white community. Right. It was a very racist community. Ah. <laughs> and we there was a lot of things that would happen to our family right. that, you know, if I had a little bit more self-awareness, I would have learned to hate racism. Right. I didn't recognize that as anything different than every day. Right. So the weird thing is I have a lot of friends who, and rightfully so, they get very quickly upset or pissed off when, you know, they are subject to things that are racially incorrect happening to them. Right. Like we'll go to, we went to uh, golf at Pinehurst and, you know, sure enough, we had a group of, we, we didn't fit the prototypical Pinehurst golf group and people made comments. To me, I was like, whatever, I was game day focused. I'm going to shoot the best score I can at Pinehurst too. And they let it, themselves get worked up. They wanted to go confront the people in the fight. And I think part of that, I don't know if it's all good or all bad, but I think because I was exposed to racism at such an early age, but I didn't connect that with wrong right. and anger and retaliation, I kind of just take it on the chin now. Right. And the great thing is it doesn't affect me negatively. And so it's kind of like I'm rising above it. And you would think ignoring it, because a lot of friends are like, you can't ignore it. You're, you're part of the problem. You're helping perpetuate that it's okay. Right. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm helping making sure that my day is the day I was ready to have and nobody's going to bring me down. Yeah. And it's this weird balance. But yeah. I just, I, the weirdest things you learn from the most odd circumstances when you're young because you're just a sponge. Right. And nobody can control what you're going to take away from it. Yeah. But then you look back, you're like, okay. So that yeah. is kind of the way my <laughs> brain got wired at an early age and, and let's make the most of it now. Yeah. I kind of can relate to that perspective as well. I look back in those high school years um, I remember I was, I think, in 10th grade, and the senior who was valedictorian was gay, and he was openly gay at a conservative Christian high school, and they weren't going to let him be valedictorian because he was gay. Just for that reason. Just for that, that reason. that was the school right. deciding and, that, and or that was, the administration? Yeah, that was the firm policy. They literally made us sign a um, contract of conduct, basically saying if you, uh, you know, act any way that's in accordance with, you know, outside of the accordance of, of uh, what they consider to be a, their ideal student, that they could have these consequences for you. Some kids would get suspended if they did something outside of school that was considered, you know, not to be acceptable in school, which is kind yep. of crazy looking back now. But that experience and all the, the ways that the school treated people who were LGBT, you know, initially on, I would take that in and say, okay, well, I'm just going to hide that part of me, you know, and just so I can keep my head down and whatever. I don't want to you know, obviously confront. I was definitely not confident enough in myself at that time. And looking back uh, now, when I hear, you know, slurs or, or aggressive comments or, or negative comments about me being gay, it doesn't bother me as much. But because I'm trying to embrace my queerness so much and be an out proud queer person, I want to stand up, right? I feel like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm supposed to stand up and fight. And, but it's not always the most beneficial for me. It, it, it almost distracts me, like you mentioned, from yep. my day. It distracts me from my positive attitude. It distracts me from my way of thinking. And instead of going back to that sticks and stones, you know, break my bones, but words can't affect me, I, need to, I, I, feel, I find that that works better for me strategy-wise. So it is this balance. Like, how do I remain an out proud person, but also not let those small things of small minds get to me. Yeah. So. And it is a balance, right? Cause you also don't want to be you know, the way I think I was for most of my life. Obviously it's different now in a leadership role. Yeah. Cause you're not just, you know, if it affects you or not, is not the only thing that matters. It's, you gotta look out for the comfort safety of the entire team. Right. And as the leader, if I see something happening, that's egregious, even if it was just to me, I might've let it go. Right. I do get involved a little bit more now, right? And it's it changes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a balance there because I don't think everything requires the same level of response. Otherwise, you, like you said, you're just going to admire the negativity yourself. Yeah. Um, 
and, and I don't want to know what ugliness might <laughs> un be For unearthed. Sure. For sure. If I allow their negativity negativity to make me negative, and then before you know it, everyone's got an inner self they haven't yet got to know. Yeah, for sure. I'd rather not know that person. Yeah. <laughs> rather not bring that person out. Exactly. Right? Especially in those aggressive moments when you're hot headed and feeling like you want to combat somebody for, for, for something that they said. You know, it's like, yep. I'm going to leave this person deep inside for now while I still process who they are and not bring them out at the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but speaking on leadership, um, you know, Obviously, you lead uh, all of us in this company. As a young person, did you find yourself often in a leadership role, or was that not really your style? How would you kind of absolute that? opposite? I was very introverted. Yeah. Um, even in high school, I was part of all the um, you know uh, students against drunk driving, all, all yeah. those extracurricular programs, but sure. never once thought. I'm going to run for a position in leadership, right? right. Where all the other friends who were kind of on that academics, 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 the whole goal of going to high school is to prepare yourself to get into a good college, which came with, this is the checklist of things you must do. Right. Joining those programs was one of those things. Right. And signing up to a leadership position in those was the normal track. I just never had a desire. Yeah. Um, I think it really wasn't until I got to my first professional job at Intel where it was more so because I finally felt I was in a group of peers that were similar minded, similar backgrounds, um, that I, I got that confidence of yeah. just being me, I can lead this team. Right. Um, I, I think early days I was, I was in a lot, I was in debate. I was in uh, or competitive oratory and I brought that into how I spoke. Right, I'd speak well beyond what a 14-year-old was supposed to speak like. And I realized it was negatively affecting my ability to assimilate socially in high school. Mm -hmm. And so I made a conscious, conscious effort to shut it down. Yeah. I just started speaking more simply, started acting more like the other kids. And before you know it, I was getting a little bit more and more normal and popular. Sure. Like, this is way better. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't until I realized at an older age when I got to Intel and felt comfortable that, okay, no, everyone around me is like me. Nobody's going to judge me if I speak very technically or, you know, use words that are not in normal vocabulary. Right. And I think that comfort of being back around people where I didn't have to present myself as a fake me. Right. I don't know if it was a fake me because it, it still was me, but right. I know I was making conscious decisions to not be my full authentic self. And getting that comfort zone around me again is where I think the desire to then lead came from. Because right. I was able to see other folks at Intel that I'm like, man, I see that you went through some of the same things. And nobody here is helping you bring yourself back to that fully confident self. Right. And knowing that I went through that journey, that's kind of what got me into wanting to be in leadership. And so at Intel... My trajectory kind of started going that way, where I was leading small teams, then managing um, a big account team internationally. And then the, I think the international experience took it to the next level. Yeah. Because when you have to lead people who have a language barrier, you really learn to slow down, understand the person you're talking to, and communicate in a way where you're using far more than just words. Right. It's your body language. It's your tone. It's your just how you carry yourself to be able to build trust and get people to follow you, even though the words alone <laughs> um, are not necessarily fully understood. Right. And then when I brought, came back to the US um, and then started this business, it was something that I didn't want to lose. Right. Every time I move, I kind of go through this process of, okay, what personal growth things did you gain that are good? And what things about yourself did you learn now that you are in a different environment and you can reflect and see where before, in that bubble, like you said, it was very hard to realize what things I was doing that were negative, that everyone around me was doing were negative, were negative. Right. But you take yourself out of that context, and you're like, oh, wow, I was a little bit of a dick. <laughs> let's, let's not take that with us in the next place I move to. And right. it's been great getting that personal growth each time, um, but really getting to see it because you're changing your environment, and you really see things about yourself that just were blind spots. Right when they're the norm of the environment you're in before seeing it in a different light. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, just out of personal curiosity, I, you know, often think if I could go back uh, to college again, I should have done something or I would do something more tech heavy. 
Uh, obviously, uh, I think it was quite a topic in the 90s mm-hmm. and early 2000s that this is where industry was moving. And so between between health and tech were kind of like my choices. Um, I, I fell into health mainly because it just identified with more things that I was interested in. And I, I've always been kind of interested in computers, but it didn't come to me naturally. And so I, at the time, was just focused on things that came to me naturally. <laughs> so looking back in, in your, you know, beginning of your career at Intel, what kind of led you there in high school and in, in college? Did you know, I, I love tech, this is what I want to do? Or um, did you kind of fall into that? I, I think it's similar to yours, where I mean, part of it, I always had like an engineering mind, I like breaking toys and putting them back together and seeing what's inside. So I had a very curious mind. Um, but no, I just, my dad got me a computer when I was young. I liked it. And it was one of those, I didn't go through the normal progression that a, I I think a child goes through going from elementary to high school to college, things just kind of decisions I made just because they were natural. I never thought about what's my major going to be. I like computers. I went to the university of Michigan. First day I went and, uh, declared my major in computer engineering before even having taken a single class. But I never thought about, okay, this career path is going to provide me with these opportunities or this pay or enable me to go explore this passion I had. It literally was computers were fun. They were, I was naturally good at them. So yeah, sure. Computer engineering. Yeah. And I don't know if I had taken more time right in that sophomore year, junior year to sit down and say, what do I want to be in 10 years that the answers would have led to computer engineering. I think because I didn't even think about it. And I just went to what was natural. I ended up in a path that I think was the right best path for me. Cause I don't know that any other career path would have been as rewarding or would have ended here. Right. And I love where it's, in. I mean, it's not over, Sure. but where I am right now, I, I do know is kind of the best part yeah. of my entire career journey. And I'm glad that all those choices have led to here. Sure. If you, uh, you know, had people come up to you who were, you know, in high school and they said, you know, I want to go into tech. I have no idea, you know, what that exactly means, but I know that I'm interested in technology. I love computers, you know, is, should I pick a certain major? Should I, I mean, I'm not sure if you would consider yourself to be like the person, uh, you know, I don't know if you're a a college admissions (laughs) type person, but you know, if you have any advice for those people who are, you know, just getting started with their career and, and maybe just getting started with school, like how would they get into tech? Is there like a process or do they need certain classes? I mean, I think if at foundationally math and science, yeah. um, you have to like them. True. Um, because if you don't like them, the, the future like college path in engineering or tech has a lot of advanced math and science classes. Right. And I think a lot of people make career or educational choices because they think they want to do something but then they don't realize they're having to spend half of your college time in right. subjects that you hate. Exactly. And I think it almost takes away their motivation to go do greater things. Cause they're like, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to get my degree. I'm going to go do what I signed up for, but that love is not there. Right. So as much as, you know, some people look at it as, okay, that's going to make me more money. I hope they also consider how many hours of your college time is going to be spent in what subject matter and you should hopefully find something that's going to actually maximize your time in your college right. in the subject matter you love. Cause you have access to learning things at a level deeper and more um, just advanced than you've ever been given access in any other part of your you know, elementary school, high school, right. whatever. You don't realize that when you make that choice, right. but you will leave that opportunity on the table if you just don't like what you're doing. And so I think first is acknowledging math and science better be something you like. And if you don't, then think hard about if you really do want to pursue tech. Yeah. Um, But if you do like those two, I think it's fairly easy to get into. I mean, now, especially, um, I I think programming classes are are almost the norm in any, (laughs) even as as early as elementary school. Yeah. Um, Engineering classes are the norm earlier now. Those things weren't available in the normal American high school curriculum when I was growing up. Right. So I think it is fairly easy. Um, and then on the flip side, if someone's not sure what they want to do and they're just like, what would you recommend? I would say if you have the, the will and the wherewithal, I tell everyone to go into computer engineering. Uh, not because of the career path you're going to get afterwards, because with computer engineering, if you're successful at it, you're good at it, you can go into any career path. Right. Because an engineering kind of curriculum to me teaches you how to learn 
yes. more than teaches you the actual subject matter. Um, no offense to the medical field. There's a lot of <laughs> like hands-on things sure. later as you get yes. into, you know, learning how to do surgery or some right. of the more um, involved things. But right. earlier where it's very biology heavy, it's a lot of memorization. Yes. And yeah, you could, you could ace your, you know, your bar because, or your, your exams, because you just memorized everything. Right. But then if you're in a transition from medicine to something else that doesn't have any of that biology, all that time you spent learning and memorizing those things don't apply. Where instead, if you spent those eight years learning how to learn, throw yourself into any environment and you'll figure it out more quickly than others because you've kind of figured out not just how to learn, because it's not universal. Right. It's how your brain learns. And knowing how you learn most optimally, knowing that truly, will let you move into anything and quickly, quickly figure it out. Yeah, I, I definitely um, can understand, uh, you know, with my experience, you know, I got my uh, undergrad in public health with a minor in biology, but most of my courses that I was learning in undergrad had nothing to do and still have nothing to do with what I do on a daily day basis now. You know, the bulk of everything I learned that I use now on a daily basis in my career was done in residency, not even in medical school. Medical school was the foundation, but I look at undergrad and I don't want to call it a waste, but you know, you do have those building block courses like organic chemistry and biology mm -hmm. where you are learning the fundamentals, but you spend a four years really creating a degree, trying to get into medical school that is really not useful. <laughs> and for a lot of, for a lot of people, you know, now it's becoming more popular where, People will get, um, you know, degrees in engineering or English or really anything to go into medical school. Whereas before when I was applying, it was everybody was in biology, yep. physics or chemistry, something, you know, science related. But if you didn't get into medical school, you could teach or you could do research or you went back to school. So my uh, understanding of undergrad is... It, I don't want to say it feels like a waste, but it just felt like a lot of time that was not used um, as optimally as I could, especially if I didn't end up getting into medical school. So like, you know, in your comparison, if you go into engineering, you after that four year mark, you've got all the skills you really need to be able to start your career then. Would you agree with that? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to I mean, right. so my, my, <laughs> my journey was a little different. <laughs> right. I got an internship at Intel my freshman year. Oh, and so I went took a semester off, spent eight months at Intel learning things that were not even part of the curriculum till the 300 and 400 level, which I would get to my junior and senior year. Right. So I fast tracked right as a freshman, I was already doing computer engineering at that senior level at Intel. Then I'd come back and just go through the motions to pass the tests to get out of the hundreds and out of the two hundreds. And I kept going back to Intel. Yeah. So in that same sense, the four years or five years that I call undergrad, Yes, I came out of that ready to go enter the professional world with all the things I needed to be successful. Right. But I don't know that that's truly just because the four years of engineering curriculum or the way I augmented it by going and learning and working in industry. Yeah. Um, especially in industry that, you know, the things I was working on at Intel during the summer were things that were proprietary and still within, you know, their five year roadmap things that had not yet trickled down into what was wow. being taught in school. Sure. Um, and I think that's why even school wasn't as exciting. Right. Um, Cause it was going through the motions, but there was still, <laughs> you know, I, it, I learned a lot. Yeah. There, there's no question. I was still for learning sure. for sure. I just wasn't as excited about what I was learning as, as soon as, you know, the, the spring session ended and I went back to Intel and here I am now getting access to things that were well beyond what, right. what I was learning in school. Absolutely. Um, how did you get into that internship? Was it something that you had to go for yourself or was it offered at your school? Random luck, um, uh, job fair dropped yeah. off my resume freshman year job fair, just to see what was coming for the next summer. Knew okay. that as a freshman, no one's going to give me an internship. So just left off what year I am in school. <laughs> Randomly one, yeah. one day freshman year, I got a call at like 8am on like a Saturday or something. It was absurd. And I answered it, you know, half asleep. We'll just call it that. <laughs> um, and they were like, yeah, this is so-and-so from Intel. I'm like, who? Like, I'm, my brain wasn't even... Right. And it was an interview. I forgot I even dropped off my resume at the Intel desk at the job fair. Did this one-hour interview over the phone. And I think he's, oh, wait, one more question I forgot to ask. What year are you? Because I'm looking for somebody who is wanting a summer internship going into their senior year. And then would be 
seriously considering joining full time on the team afterwards. Right. Like, this is my first semester of school. <laughs> and he's like, okay, well, I've interviewed a lot of people for this role already, and none of them interviewed as well as you did. So as much as I wanted someone who was going to be available to join full time, I'll take a flyer on you because something is interesting yeah, here. Right. And so that's how I got the job. And then I went back to Intel every summer, kept taking time away from school to go learn, joined Intel full time when I graduated, and then was with them in, in a total of 19 years from when I was 19 to when I quit at 38. Crazy. So looking back at that interview, if you can recall it, what do you think you said or, or what do you think stood out? I mean, obviously this was years ago and I'm putting you on the spot here. Yep. Do you recall anything that may have made you stand out or may have... I mean, it was 8 a.m. on a Saturday that you took this call and had this hour interview. I think that's pretty good to start. I, I think it's still still part of who I am now. And it was, I'm not really shy yeah. or I don't get nervous. Yeah. I think that alone, like you ask me a question, I'll answer it to my best of my abilities and I'll tell you what I don't know. And if I get the job, I get the job. If I don't, I don't. But I think just that transparency of thought, I think a lot of people get in their own way right. by overthinking interviews. And I don't think there's anything I said that, oh, he's smarter than the other candidate or he knows computer engineering more at a technical level than the other candidate. Right. I think it was just the confidence of what do you want to know? Open book. Yeah. And they're like, okay, I could see that innate skill being something that's going to help you navigate a crazy professional world where there's a lot thrown at you and you can get frazzled or, you know, um, so I think it was just that. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I always think about the um, moments in my life where a major change was made or I was really proud of myself. And looking back, the main theme was that I was confident in all of those situations. And I think that's kind of a great takeaway from, you know, relying on yourself, trusting in yourself at all times, mm -hmm. know who you are, deliver it at all times, be confident. Yeah, I think the, um, so going back to that interview, you're like, well, right, how did right. you get that job versus all the other people who applied? And I'm like, I don't know. I just went in there, nothing to lose. Let's show them who I am and see what happens. And I, and I get a lot of, whether it's people I'm mentoring or people on the team, I always ask, what is it that you're trying to do in your life three years from now, five years from now? And I'm always surprised. People have a very clear vision of what they want to do. Right. Oh, I want to move from the supervisor role to a management role. Like, okay. And they're like, in two years. Because I, I know there's some skills I need to gain. There's some gaps that I'm working on. I have a development plan. I'm like, understood. Have you started interviewing for that role? Mm -hmm. And they're always like, no, I just told you. There's things I need to do first. Right. And I, my advice is start interviewing now for that management position at other companies. Knowing you're not going to get the job. For the main reason is every interview for every role is different. And don't let the dream job or something you worked two years for slip away from you because in that first moment where it really matters, you're uncomfortable or you were surprised or you were unfamiliar or you right. got caught off guard. And the best way to do that is go apply. Um, and, and no, you're not going to get it. No, you don't want it. Right. Just go get familiar with the process so that when you are finally there two years later, feeling like I've checked all the boxes, now I think I can get the job. You have a leg up on anyone else who's interviewing for that role because most of them are interviewing for the first time in that capacity and they don't put their best foot forward. So there are some people who are just naturally confident in that environment. Most people are nervous. Right. The way to plan around that is familiarize yourself with that most important interview well before you get there. Right. I mean, in college, even after I had my job, I would keep interviewing, partly for the free trips, because, yeah. hey, if they're going to fly <laughs> me out and pay for my food and put me in a hotel, right. I'm 19, I'll do it. Exactly. But I found that the best interviews I've ever had were for jobs that I didn't want, because I already had a job. I was literally just, you know, fuck around, find out mentality. Yeah. It's that. And you truly get to learn that I'm actually really good at interviewing when I knew that I wasn't worried about getting the job. Yes. You do it enough, muscle memory, even the job you want, you'll flow right in and present your best self. Right. So that's my advice to everyone. They're, they're sometimes taken off guard. I'm like, no, I'm not telling you to go apply for other jobs outside of our company and leave us. Right. I'm telling you, if you're serious about two years from now wanting to be a manager, 
go apply for them now so that by the time you're ready to apply, you have nothing to worry about. Absolutely. So preparation, I guess, in a different way, but yeah. familiarity. Just, just don't let yourself be caught off guard. You can control your destiny. Most people know that, but they don't act on it and take the steps. Right. I think you know a lot of practice makes perfect is yep. sort of the the motto to to keep in mind. I think as a, a physician myself, you know, getting into telemedicine was kind of this this leap. I didn't really know exactly what that was that transition was going to look like. When I started interviewing, I was super uncomfortable. I didn't have much experience in telehealth, but what I did learn was that in the interview process for a lot of startups and new companies that were also venturing into this new realm of telehealth, that I was getting to meet CEOs, I was getting to meet CFOs, CMOs, people I had never even come in contact with working in an urgent care and primary care, even in residency. And so I started learning the skills of just how to talk to those people yep. and, and figuring out what I could offer, even if it was nothing. I have something. I'm a human being. I have something to offer and figuring out how I can leverage that in a position to not only hopefully get the job, but if not, at least grow from the experience, yep. you know. And so I think looking back with your advice that you're giving to, to all of us, um, I, I definitely can see how it has already impacted my life and, and starting to focus on that. I think, you know, you can really take it anywhere. Every interview, every experience is a learning process. You know, mm -hmm. There's no real failure there, especially if your goal is to get into that leadership position. It's not going to fall into your lap and you're not going to necessarily learn the skills that are going to take you exactly to that destination. That trial and error, that human interaction, I think is, is a much easier way to get yourself into those, those higher um, higher levels of, of where you want to be as far as education, leadership, employment, all of it, really relationships. You can really use that philosophy anywhere. Yeah. And there's the bounce back too, right? So if you've waited and that's the job you want, that's the first interview and you fail, right? Even though you're confident you did all the right things, there's a chance that that failure will change your mind and make you think I was wrong. It's not for me. Right. If you go in with preparation, even the no, you take it, take it, you just keep going forward. I'll, I'll apply again. I'll apply again. Yep. Because the no doesn't scare you right. once you get familiar. Yeah. Um, and that, like you said, it's with everything: relationships, professional life, personal life, with anything. Learning how to take no in stride is probably a skill that's, you know, far and few between have it. Right. But that is the difference with someone who will, you know, like Michael Jordan's, like fall down a hundred times and always get back up. Yeah. You got to teach yourself that it's not natural in anyone. Right. And so put yourself in situations where you know you're not going to get what you want. Get comfortable there. Exactly. Because then when it's something that you want, you won't let a potential failure set you back. More likely, you're not even going to fail in the first place. Right. It's true. And you get more comfortable in those scenarios so you're able to be your authentic self, which is how yep. you're going to present You know what you're able to contribute the best. Um, as far as you know, hearing no, which none of us want to hear, do you feel like up to this point in your career, you've heard no a lot? Has that been something that's been a theme for you? I think so, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, and not because I was failing at what I was doing. I get bored really easily, and I love chasing new learning. Right. And to do that, you got to apply for things that my resume does not show well of why <laughs> I should be the one for that job. Right. Right? So when you're going into things that are so different yeah you're gonna get told no and but the reasons you get for no if you know who you are and they're usually well you've never tried this before so how do I know that if I put you in this role you're gonna succeed yep those are the no's I've gotten always but that's my fuel right and usually you get a good person like bet on me right <laughs> and if I fail then my bad right but bet on me first and I guarantee you I won't fail right it, it, it's being able to diffuse the no before the no even comes at you right? by showing them that, yeah, I see what you see. I'm not crazy. There's no reason an engineer should be applying for a marketing job. <laughs> but if your only reason that you think I can't do it is yeah. because I haven't done marketing, well, we can go down this whole theory of logic. and like You could argue anything in life is impossible by that logic. Right. Right. Then we're all just bots programmed and born <laughs> to do one thing and exactly. one thing well with no opportunity to ever change or develop or progress, that's not true. Right. Every human grows. And if you're saying what you've done in the past is indicative of only what you can do in the future, then you're saying growth is not possible. Right? So I, 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 those people that have that mentality annoy me, they irk me, <laughs> they piss me off, but most importantly, they motivate me because I love sure. proving them wrong. Sure.
And uh, so in regards to where we're at now with Rajet Health, did you hear a lot of no's at the beginning? Or did you feel as though you were kind of more supported? In, we in still the, hear no's. Yeah. I still hear no's, right? I mean, that thing that's with anything you're doing that's innovative, that's revolutionary, that's new and novel, the no's are the norm. It's human nature to doubt someone who's trying to do something so against the flow. Yeah. Like, and then, and mostly cause they're trying to protect you. Right. Right. <laughs> they're worried about, well, the risk, what's going to happen if you fail? Like I, I, I love you. You're confident, you're capable, but you're doing well. Why are you trying to risk off into this space where you could take who you are that we love, right. Fail. And we don't want you to be a, a lesser version or feel defeated. Absolutely. Um, so it's not that I'm getting a lot of pushback or no's because they don't believe. I think it's more out of concern of you're doing a low statistical probability of success thing. Right. Why? And that's just the because my brain is wired different than yours. <laughs> if it was high probability of success, I'd be bored. And right. so that's why I don't do it. Because boredom is the ultimate enemy of everything in right. my mind. And it's like, I guess, going back to just being a natural born leader or even developing yourself as a leader and, and maybe even being a disruptor in a way um, to try to push yourself into areas that are obviously uncomfortable, knowing that that's where you're going to blossom the most, just where you're going to do the best. And I think um, when you are a leader and you're surrounded by no's and on occasion, it's almost like, a, OK, I'm actually doing the right thing. Everyone thinks I'm crazy, so I must be doing something that's disruptive, yep. something that's going to make a big impact. Um, as far as hearing no's from yourself, do you ever feel as though you combat that self-doubt that am I doing the right thing? Is this what's best for me? Is this what's best for the company? How do you navigate dealing with the no's coming from you? Good question. Um, and I, just so I think as I, as I dissect that in different aspects of my life, right. I approach it differently, right? Sure. In some places, I think I do a much better job professionally. Yeah the no's are easy to just blow through. Like, right. Even if they're coming from myself. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes in personal life or family matters or things that are tougher for me, some people could be the opposite, right? They're just natural with their friends. They don't worry, but in, in career they get frazzled. Right. Um, I think those no's are tougher because at the end of the day, I'm an empath and I hate hurting people, but I, I realize there's this push pull to do what I want to do professionally, I'm going to hurt people personally, but I'm going to benefit so many more people from that professional progress that you learn to be, you get comfortable knowing that some people are going to get hurt right. and you got to keep looking at the bigger picture. True. Um, and I think that was probably the hardest learning because it's really hard to come to terms with. There is no bigger positive than making sure the people you love are at their optimal, right? Helping a million people you don't know versus hurting someone you know, naturally, most people would say, I'm not hurting the person I know. Right. Um, but over time, I've gotten more and more comfortable with it yeah. to understand and knowing that they're going to get it later too. Right. In the short term, they might feel hurt. Short term, they might not get you. Yeah. In the end, the people that love you, love you. Right you put it in your head that you're going to hurt them and they're not going to get you. The reality is if they love you, if you love them, that relationship is strong. It can endure anything. Right. Um, and usually it's just you that's in the way of that and your, your mind overthinking things. For sure. I noticed for myself, um, you know, as a busy person who's working a lot um, and I have family and, and relationship, I feel like I sometimes wear different hats. Like I have my professional hat, I have my relationship hat and my family hat. And sometimes I can really only wear one hat in a day. You know, I feel as mm -hmm. though all my energy can be only put in one direction so I can be my optimal. So I do struggle a lot um, with making sure that I can devote enough energy everywhere so I end up shutting out certain areas on certain days. For example, um, me and my mom have kind of a interesting relationship. It takes a lot of energy. Um, so I typically will, you know, close that off on certain times of the week or certain stressful days, but then knowing that unfortunately it does hurt her, but it helps me to live my life and be a functional yep. human being. Alternatively, I would be devoting too much energy to her, couldn't devote enough to work, couldn't devote enough to my relationship. And so it becomes like this juggling problem. I know you mentioned, you know, um, 
as far as, you know, listening to know to yourself when you are, you know, at work versus in your relationships versus family. I think that's something I struggle with right now is like learning to say, I need to, to say no to, to things that are taking too much of my energy and just focus on where I can be, you know, my most optimal. And then ultimately, you know, that's the best situation for everyone. So before we end today, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. This is our first session together, and I guarantee Hopefully many more to come. <laughs> yes. I really enjoyed this conversation. I, I think there are so many more topics and so many more discussions that we could have that right. hopefully your, your viewers find interesting. But even just, just to have the conversation, I'm learning things that even though it was a stream of thought, as I reflect back on what I said or what you said, I, I think I, I can't wait. And I look forward to the next time we're doing this again. Yeah, me too. I think we're going to have plenty to talk about. We clearly already have shown that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to next time. So uh, we look forward to seeing you guys or um, hopefully having you guys listen to us for our next episode where we're together. And until that time. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.